Professor Christina Keng hails from Singapore. She's a member of the faculty at the East Asian Pastoral Institute, Manila. She teaches pastoral leadership and management at the East Asia Pastoral Institute in Philippines. And she's also a member of the Commission of Met Methodology of the General Secretariat for the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops. She participated in the recent meeting at Frascati. Professor Keng will speak to us for 20 minutes. Welcome, Professor Christina. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. We had a really good um, discussion this morning on the, the Global Synod as well as Predicate Evangelium, the reform of the Curia. And from the questions and comments that are coming from the room, uh, I can really sense also um, this uh, emerging interest to see how can we uh, manifest uh, this, the same spirit of these activities and these reforms back in the diocese. Uh, so for this afternoon, we, we will be looking at uh, the new pathways. Uh, the question that I would like to start off with exactly is, what are the new ways uh, by which we will return? Uh, and based on this uh, morning's discussion, I would like to uh, adapt a little bit more uh, to how you can bring some of these back uh, to your diocese. Uh, we have already a lot of growing interest in synodality, uh, but it's also good to be aware that sometimes synodality is misunderstood or certain aspects are overemphasized uh, uh, to the point of neglecting some of the other aspects. Uh, so what I would like to begin uh, by first going back to the roots of synodality. What exactly is it? Uh, and uh, what are the ways in which it can be misunderstood? Um, synodality is not just a pet uh, project of Pope Francis, or it's not just a fad, or it's not even something new from Vatican II. Uh, actually, uh, according to our own uh, Christian anthropology, our view of hum humankind uh, and our theology of creation, uh, we really see the world as the family of God. And this phrase comes out very well in Gaudium et Spes, Gaudium et Spes, by the way, is still one of the best um, uh, sources of Catholic anthropology in the church. Uh, so it stresses the dignity and vocation of every human being, right? So it's good to start with humankind in general. Uh, everyone is called to participate as co-workers in the divine mission of love. And also, we see humans as having an intrinsic social nature. We are meant to be in community. Uh, each of us has died diverse gifts called to be in mutual collaboration, and we have a developmental history. There's this sense of being on the journey already and not yet, uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the active presence of divine grace working with humanity. So synodality is not just a vision for the church, but really it's, it's the foundation and God's vision. It's the call for the whole, it's meant to be for the whole of humanity. And that's why the church's role is to give witness by our synodality. And that's what um, uh, 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 Lumen Gentium in Vatican II tries to recover, uh, the church's uh, uh, witness, witness value, the seed and symbol uh, of uh, synodality. And so we have this phrase, the people of God. And you see here the equivalent principles between Gaudium et Spes and Lumen Gentium. Uh, the common uh, uh, baptismal dignity where everyone is co-responsible for God's mission. And community is our identity as well as our call. Uh, we have diverse charisms which are meant to be brought in synergy. And we are all on a pilgrim journey. Uh, the, the church, you know, is always in need of purification, always on the way. So don't worry if things are not going well in, in your diocese. You know, we are always on the way. Uh, we don't have to uh, um, be so uh, uh, um, uh, anxious about this. And the risen Christ is always with us, and we are the body.
body of Christ. And Christ continues to work uh, closely with us. Uh, so this image of uh, these uh, hikers uh, in the, the forest is a very good uh, image of synodality where we are all meant to be companions, finding the way forward together by following God's Spirit, nurturing the vocation of everyone towards fullness of life. And these, each of these five points are very fa uh, essential, uh, five uh, key aspects of synodality, and none of these points can be left out. So in, th in such a, a scenario, in such an image, no one person has all the answers, and everyone has to be included. Everyone um, travels and seeks and discovers uh, the way together. Uh, and so the question for us is, in, in this uh, uh, scenario, in this kind of model, uh, what does it imply about leadership and governance? What kind of leadership and governance is needed uh, for a group that is travelling like this? I would like to focus, uh, as I mentioned, on uh, synodal leadership uh, in the diocese. Uh, and the question I'd like you to think about for a while this afternoon is, uh, think, look back at your diocese, at your experience, uh, when you were a lay person, when you were a priest, and then when you became bishop. When you look around, what current forms of leadership promote synodality in your diocese? And what current forms of leadership are contrary to it? Okay, you might have, have some uh, experiences in mind, both good and bad. Let me show you a, a few caricatures and see if uh, you might identify with any of these. Um, I would like to look a little bit more at some of the current forms of leadership uh, that are not really uh, in line with synodality or that in, in, in inhibit synodality. Okay? So the first form is what I call solo leadership, like Han Solo, you know, it's only uh, the leader decides everything, uh, the leader uh, controls everything, usually there's no consultation and, and participation uh, is only in terms of implementation. Usually though, those who want to row in the leader's direction will participate. And then the direction changes when the leader changes. Uh, as you very well know, right? A lot of parishioners uh, complain. You know, when, when a new parish priest comes, everything uh, that the old one has put in place is abolished and everything has to change. And then uh, when the priest is going to be moved away, they are so afraid, you know, is the new one going to change everything? Uh, so we see this a lot. And uh, mind you, there's no ill intent. You know, every leader has good intent, uh, but usually the leader is so, um, uh, is so much more, maybe perhaps better informed about what's good for the parish or the diocese that, you know, they, they just uh, um, try to direct everyone and direct everything with very good intent, but after a while, they are not aware that uh, it's, it becomes solo leadership. You know, they, they are determining everything. So that's one scenario. What's uh, the opposite scenario? I find it good to highlight. I call it hands-off leadership. Uh, nowadays, uh, many of the priests, uh, they misunderstand Pope Francis' notion of the inverted pyramid. They think inverted pyramid means, oh, you know, the priest step aside, uh, we just let the lay people uh, do, do whatever, do, do, do their thing, you know, we don't interfere. Uh, that's not synodal leadership at all. Inverted pyramid doesn't mean hands-off uh, leadership. You know, when people are left alone, there's no, no guidance at all, no engagement by the leader. It in the end, you know, there's a survival of the fittest and then you have, uh, everyone has their mini kingdom and then after a while you realise this is happening, it's too late to engage already. <laughs> you, you feel very powerless, you, you don't know what to do. Uh, so this is another wrong interpretation of synodality. Okay. Uh, the third uh, scenario is what I would like to call centre point leadership. This is where there is a, a two-way engagement between the leader, but the leader um, it ends up uh, um, interacting directly and managing every person, every group uh, directly uh, with no interaction among the peers or with no uh, intermediate bodies. Uh, you could do this for a very small organisation of four or five people, but when you have a big 
uh, organization or a big parish and diocese, you can't do it because it, you end up uh, being so exhausted and burned out. Uh, many of them uh, come to my institute uh, at EAPI and, and they just have to rest and sleep for the first few weeks because they are so burnt out. Uh, so center point leadership is, is, is not synodal either. Uh, the next one, of course, we all know very well is bureaucratic uh, leadership. You know, this is really like a pyramid where it's so rigid and everyone has to conform uh, by the rules, by the way it's done, and even culture is imposed top down, and there's no uh, flexibility. Uh, then, of course, there is uh, what we are very well familiar with, maintenance leadership. Uh, everyone is participating equally, you know, but to maintain the ship, but the ship is uh, not going anywhere. It doesn't dare to venture out to the deep waters because it's afraid it will, it will get broken. So you, you just, uh, everyone is very happy being very busy maintaining the, the ship where it is. Uh, and finally, uh, this one is also very common. I like to call it black box leadership. Uh, there is consultation, but unfortunately, the consultation is only one way up, you know. And, and um, we, we have seen that happening actually in this uh, global synodal process. Uh, the people give the feedback and then they, they feel like it goes into a black box. They don't know what the leader does with the feedback. Sometimes the des decision comes out very different from what they suggested or the, the, the leaders uh, vote very differently and then they don't understand why, why they did it that way. So there's no circularity, there's no transparency uh, and this kind of leadership tends to cause uh, skepticism, uh, suspicion and distrust. All right. Uh, some uh, recent, so actual, these are actual quotations from some of our countries in Asia, from the Senate reports. And from these quotations, you know that, that these things are, are really happening. One quotation is some, some people say, you know, almost all matters having to do with the life of the church are characterized as top down in their approach, right? So the, the, this is what some of our people are saying. And the laity in general feel that they are not called upon uh, to use their gifts and talents. They are not recognized and encouraged by leaders and they feel treated as second-class citizens. So we are, we, are far, we are a long way away from that inverted pyramid. And then some lament that the consultations are just uh, like a platform, you know, to, to pretend to be consulting, but actually you are not really consulting. Uh, so the structure is there, but the attitude has not changed. And as you know, uh, this is our consequence, right? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we are unable to witness uh, as the people of God. Uh, so... Back to uh, these five key elements of synodality, what does it imply for leadership and governance? Uh, I would like to just uh, quickly uh, revisit some, some or, or talk about some key principles of synodal leadership and governance. Um, uh, and, 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 and see, you know, in what way uh, uh, a, um, you and your diocese and your team can improve, okay? The first one is mutual learning, the principle of mutual learning. And Pope Francis' speech at the 50th anniversary of the Synod of Bishops is worth quoting here. We've been hearing it many times, you know, a, 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 mute, a, a synodal church is where everyone has something to learn. It's not just the teacher telling the students, but both listening to each other uh, so as to listen to the Spirit, to know what the Spirit is saying. Uh, and this is about sharing vulnerability and sharing wisdom. You know, everyone is vulnerable, everyone has wisdom. And if we can sit around the table like this and mutually listen to and learn from one another, uh, then, you know, we can start to learn how to be a synodal church. So the per first principle of synodal leadership is really about mutual learning, okay? 
The second is about helping each one to find his or her buried talents. I call it buried talents because especially in Asia, uh, there are many uh, scenarios where people's real gifts and talents are buried. Either because we have an education system that makes us conform. We, we, are, we, are, um, um, we are taught to you know, conform to a certain way to memorize the answer and then uh, uh, produce the answer in the exam. So the individual uh, charism is suppressed, uh, also in the church. Um, so um, we have to learn the art of listening to people's untold stories. Uh, we are too quick to judge and condemn, uh, but we need to learn to sit with people, to spend time, to waste time, so to speak, and to let the untold stories come out. And if we spend enough time that way, perhaps we will find the solutions uh, together. So this is about uh, accompaniment and sacred presencing and fostering the development of everyone's potential. So, so your job, you know, when you go back home, is to help your leaders to, to dig into the soil, to dig out uh, uh, all these uh, hidden treasures and hidden talents of the people, the treasures that have been buried for so long. Uh, the third principle is to, to promote the interdependence, you know, to break down silos. So think about your diocese, what are the different silos that are forming up and, and how, how can you and your leaders uh, break them down? The fourth principle is uh, what I call keeping one foot raised, you know, um, to be always on the move uh, like this uh, family here, but also supporting one another, not to be the ship that never sails out because you're so afraid to, to break, right? We, we have to um, what, uh, do what Pope Francis calls embrace the squilibrio, meaning uh, a time of disequilibrium, uh, because when you go and learn something new, when you sail out into the deep, uh, there will always be a bit of this equilibrium uh, experienced by the boat and you must know, you must learn how to navigate that. Otherwise, you, we would never be on mission, we would never be going out. And then uh, finally, uh, to give as much importance to the process as to the accomplishments. Uh, very often, that kind of solo leadership is because we, we are so passionate about the mission that we, we want to get there and achieve it as quickly as possible. And we think it's faster if we just tell people what to do. Uh, but synodality is about building the community, you know, um, promoting everyone's uh, uh, potential and their development. Uh, and so we need to take time, like uh, Cardinal Hollerich said, you know, to, to, to stay with the tensions because it's the, the tensions that will make us grow and strengthen and, and be, be reach our fuller potential. And we, we realize that it's the transformation that happens during the process and not when you, when you get to the end. So I really like this picture here because it's about the, the upper and the lower, you know, the, the, the tension of going forward, going back, going forward, going back. Uh, don't worry if your pastoral plan or your, your ideas feel as if it's two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. You know, though it's not a failure, it's a journey. You, you have to take care of the process. Um, and you know, that, that's why even in this uh, current global synod, uh, we are focusing so much on the process. You know, let's, let's take time. You know, if we, if we um, uh, 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 um, get something wrong, let's, let's, let's listen again. Let's go back and listen once again, uh, take time. So, um, how do we put all these uh, pr uh, principles into practice? I'd like to uh, offer some uh, concrete uh, suggestions, some things you can do uh, when you go back home. Uh, five suggestions. Okay, the first one is to develop people's capacity for communal discernment in a gradual way, right? As uh, we have been saying, you know, in our education system, we are not taught to discern. Most of us, in, especially in Asia, we are, we are taught to uh, memorize answer and reproduce answer in the exam and to conform and to follow the rule book. So this quote from Pope Francis is very worth uh, revisiting. He says, today the church needs to grow in discernment. This is very clear in the Maurice Letizia 
culture, we are used to a yes, you can, no, you can't mentality. And generally, above all, we who are part of the religious setting um, don't often show little ability to discern. We don't know how to do it, for we have been educated with another theology that is more formal. We go as far as you can or you can't. Uh, so, uh, to make this uh, a paradigm shift, it takes time. Don't, don't get um, uh, disappointed if you don't achieve it overnight. Uh, it takes time. Uh, the first is to be aware that we have this uh, yes, no, can, cannot mentality. And, that, and so, we, we tend to go back to church documents and, and look at it in a static way. Uh, this is even the same for Vatican II. We can't take the text of Vatican II and say that, oh, this is not written in Vatican II, so why are we doing that now? Uh, that's what's happening with synodality, right? We all know it's, it's, that word itself is hardly mentioned in Vatican II. Or, you know, if, if we are looking at the whole people of God, does it mean that uh, the priesthood or the, the, the role of bishops or the collegiality of, of, uh, of the bishops is not as important? Uh, that's not the case because we really have to look at things from a developmental uh, point of view to see councils and church teachings as a journey of development, right? From Nicaea to Constantinople to Chalcedon. We can't stop there and we can't freeze it. So if we look at earlier councils and, and um, the, like, uh, the, the smaller trees and we see, oh, this tree is very good. Let's, let's put in place a lot of uh, the canon law and the structures to improve Implement it. But we forget that it's part of a developing journey. Uh, we can't um, uh, uh, be fixed, uh, be frozen in those structures and those uh, rules forever. We have to be aware that those, um, that original idea uh, has to keep developing. We have to keep exploring and let it grow. Um, the same thing was happening with the Pharisees. They were putting all these uh, thousands of rules and laws in place to, and, and that ended up freezing uh, freezing the the, the Judea, uh, uh, the, 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 the Jewish tradition, and Jesus was trying to break through that to to move them forward and not to be be, be calcified and frozen in those structures. Uh, that's why uh, more and more we are sensing, you know, um, the growth of synodality. Uh, uh, the, the, including the whole people of God. But that doesn't mean that the collegiality of bishops is destroyed. No, if we all have to take it as part of a whole development uh, of that whole idea. Uh, so the, the key question is, you know, how is God's spirit uh, moving us forward? We have to keep uh, going back to that question. Uh, and it's about uh, the art of the pilgrim hermeneutic. This phrase was used by Pope Francis in his homily last year to launch the synod process in his own diocese. It's a very nice phrase. We have to relearn this pilgrim hermeneutic. Uh, and that requires um, faithfulness to an unfolding journey. It's not faithfulness to one document per se, and so we are so fixated on that document, but it's faithfulness to an unfolding journey. Uh, uh, journey, right? Uh, that uh, um, uh, requires two key skills, resourcement and agionamento, going back to the roots of our sources and updating. Uh, and we have to remember the sources of discernment is not uh, different uh, people arguing for what they want, but it's really uh, first, you know, looking at our faith tradition, scripture and especially in scripture and church teachings, looking at the concrete data and hearing people's stories, the power of their, their real stories. And that's what, that was what Paul and Barnabas did when they shared the stories of the Gentiles, both at the centre and the peripheries, uh, listening to the sciences and the, hum the humanities, but also interpreting intelligently and not just taking everything as the gospel truth, but, but even, you know, faith tradition evolves, you know, so everything has to be reflected upon and understood more deeply uh, in the prayerful spirit. Okay, so that's, that's something we have to recover, the art of the pilgrim hermeneutic. So we develop people's uh, capacity for communal discernment in a gradual way. Uh, what you can do is perhaps uh, start with a small uh, uh, project, uh, but take concrete steps. Uh, an issue in your diocese uh, that is doable, 
uh, involve some people, but not too many people, not too complex. For example, uh, some of these uh, things, all right? Uh, choose something doable that you can do. Decide on the process and the participants for this communal discernment. Uh, and I've given you a website here where you can look at various methods and processes engage the help of experienced persons. And here we are very, very happy to see how some Episcopal conferences are sharing skilled uh, facilitators uh, in the synodal process, uh, provide training and resources, carry it out with a timeline, and then review, when you're finished, uh, get together and review the experience, what do you learn? And so slowly, when you keep doing this, uh, the, the culture and the, the, the capacity for communal discernment will gradually grow in your diocese. Uh, so it's good to know that communal discernment uh, does require a proper process. Uh, you can use various methods, but it should have at least uh, these, uh, ele these four elements. Uh, the first one is, is the, that relevant information, the data and, and the knowledge from the sciences has to be given out to people. They, they have to spend time to pray with it, to reflect and to evaluate it. Uh, there must be some dialogue where there is sharing and listening, uh, chance to ask questions and to, to speak with each other and to examine the viewpoints together, um, to consider the church teachings and the guiding values and to really understand them. And finally, you know, uh, uh, to pay attention to how the Holy Spirit is, is moving, is speaking to the group. So it's really a process that, that requires the heart and the head and to develop the conclusion progressively, to test it out, to evaluate and to maybe even to, to fine-tune it. Okay? Uh, there is this uh, important part on decision-making and decision-taking uh, in the, the document by the International Theology Commission on Synodality. Uh, and it, it addresses that issue which people often complain about. You know, if, if my bishop is the one making the decision, why do we waste time discussing and discerning? Uh, so this part really stresses that there, there has to be a a connect, it's a connection between the decision making, you know, and the decision taking. Decision making is the process that involves everyone, and the decision taking has to be integrated with it. It's part of the census fidelium. It's the same uh, Holy Spirit speaking. Uh, so, um, in the the the, the process. The final decision the taker has to be integrated in that whole process. Otherwise, uh, it's dis, uh, disconnected. And that's why people are very uh, skeptical about communal discernment. Uh, very often, it's because the one who takes the final decision does not respect the process uh, of that whole um, discernment. So we, we, you have to be part of it. Uh, and people learn uh, synodality uh, when they do uh, synodality. And that's why it's important to, to start with uh, some things that they can do. And that emerges very clearly from the synodal process. And th these are again some direct quotes from it. All this is published in the FABC website in the country reports. Uh, and Professor so people say, you know, that's... Christina, yes. if you can finish okay. within a minute, okay, you're over short the time. Yes, okay, thank you, I will. Yeah, so um, people are, 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 are really saying that the process has taught them uh, to be synodal. Okay, so I do have uh, a few uh, other points, but these are uh, sh um, quite, um, should be quite familiar with you. Ways, concrete ways in which you can promote synodal leadership in your diocese. Uh, the second one is to promote uh, relationship, collaboration, and leadership at the intermediate levels so that you, um, you bring uh, uh, people who are working on relevant issues together uh, and you build that subsidiarity and they can journey with each other okay uh, for instance um, in this uh, conference the fact that we, we are all in small groups allows each one's voice to be heard and it's not possible for everyone to take turns to speak up in the plenary so we are already doing that as part of our process in this conference 
Okay. Uh, the third one uh, is uh, to identify um, diocesan pastoral priorities together through communal discernment, uh, to have a good pastoral plan that responds to the signs of the time so that the whole diocese is, is on mission. Everybody uh, uh, um, is, is uh, responsible for mission uh, together. Uh, the fourth is to renew formation uh, at all levels. And for this, I would like to stress uh, the promotion of active inquiry as a pastoral habit. Uh, you can show the way by modelling that instead of always jumping to, to teach or to tell or to judge, uh, begin by asking open-ended questions so as to know more deeply. Uh, so, so it's good to adopt active inquiry as a pastoral habit. Uh, and finally, uh, to lead as a team, uh, you don't have to do everything alone. No doubt uh, you are responsible for the governance of your diocese, but you can form teams to assist you in governance so that you won't be like the, the, the center point leader who is uh, stretched in, in every way uh, and burned out. Uh, no time to pray, uh, no time to reflect and read. Uh, so these are just five simple suggestions uh, to promote synodality in the diocese. Uh, and I would like to just end with um, this uh, uh, reflection that um, a new way for us perhaps is to share our joys and challenges together, to, to walk together with the God who walks with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Christina for sharing with us such useful insights on the principles of synodal leadership and the various suggestions for putting them into practice. We will just observe a few moments of prayerful silence. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.